Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the final lockdown live stream of 2021, uh, 1st of December. Um, final because actually we're picking up around here in the hotel and uh, we are so busy. I've had to come and sit here in the garden and uh, and enjoy from here, which is a very, very, very nice place to be. I can just about see some elephants down there. So I am, I'm talking to you from the Anantara Golden Triangle Garden. Uh, we're finishing 2021 with one of the most interesting lectures. Well, they've all been interesting, so I should the laws of elephant or elephant laws in Thailand. And um, we have for years said that uh, elephants, if I, ever asked about the law, we've said, oh, the elephants, uh, captive elephants come under the Beast of Burden Act 1949. Um, and that's, that sounds about something sensible you can say about elephant laws. But the real truth is far more complicated, including wild elephants being almost a separate species in the eyes of the law and the as captive elephants um, and various other things going on around, um, of course, legislation about elephants that has been being part of Thailand as long as Thailand has been Thailand. So uh, today we're going to hear from two speakers who will demystify the laws for you and I and everybody else. First up will be Ajahn Chakrit Situet uh, from, uh, I think, uh, the Faculty of Law in Tamasat University, a, a lecturer in uh, environmental law in Bangkok. And then second will be Sally Yang, who has been studying um, the, the elephant laws of Thailand for, um, for USAID and for, to, to, help, to help smooth the passage, hopefully, of, of a meaningful elephant law that can bring it sooner or later um, under, under one umbrella so we all know where we are in Thailand legally when it comes to elephants. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Ajahn Chakrit, who's going to start us off, and then we will go from there. Ajahn, please share your screen. Yes, please. Good evening, everyone. Um, I will start first by uh, taking you guys through the history of the Thai elephant law. Um, actually, uh, if you think uh, talking about elephant law, uh, it may be for you guys would think about wildlife and biodiversity protection. That's the modern meaning, mo modern meaning, but for us Thai people, uh, in the history, we don't treat animals, especially beasts of burdens, that way. So I would uh, uh, guide you through the the process called elephant management protection. Uh, I, I personally call it elephant exploitation. It's a go along with the forest exploitation. That will be the scene I would like to set uh, this evening. And for that, I um, would go through the history from the beginning of the Kingdom of Thailand in the in this area, like uh, so-called Thai era, Ayutthaya era, Thonburi era, and currently Ratanakosin era. Um, we used to use elephants for so many things. Even we took them to the war. Actually, it's not only in Thailand. Uh, as far as I know, in many uh, civilizations, use elephants to war from Greek, Roman, and to the in Asia. Um, and I think the most important event of exploitation elephants in Thailand is uh, the enter into the entry in entry into force of the so-called Bowring Treaty back in 1855. Uh, under that treaty with the British Empire, Thailand or the Siam at the time was forced to uh, export a lot of goods including teak and to do teak industry we need a uh, Elephants, and at the time, I believe we exploited elephants the most, so we can keep up with the export demand of teak and other woods. 
at the time, probably we, we were forced to do that. But after some time, I think we enjoy uh, exploiting wood and our forest because uh, some people can get rich. So I think that was the very important moment in our history. And to look at the elephant management and protection or elephant exploitation from the history, I would like to uh, look into four dimensions. That is, uh, look at the elephant as beast of burden and look from the view of ed epidemic prevention, wildlife elephant protection and breeding development protection. I would go for the beast of burden first. Surprisingly, uh, we had uh, beast of burden control since the ancient time, but um, we had a recorded law for the first time back in 1876. So at the time we had Cattle Act and later Cattle Taxes Act. And then we got, in 1891, we got improved those laws by introduce or standardized registration system. So we can control beasts of burden, including elephant a lot better. And it was clear that the purpose of the better registration system was to uh, prevent thief of beasts of burden, especially elephants, because we, elephants become really uh, so valuable because they can work in many fields, in, especially in forestry. And on top of that, this registration would help the, the authority at the time uh, collect better or more effective tax. And the uh, beast of burden law has been uh, improved over time and the most recent one was enacted in 1939 and still in force until today. That will be the brief history of the law on beast of burden in Thailand. The next one is the law on epidemic prevention. We started it early too, back in 1896. The authority at the time realized the harms of epidemics in beast of burden that would uh, cause harm to humans and the economics. So the law was introduced, especially to introduce a systematic diagnostic and prevention measure among beasts of burdens and the law evolved until uh, uh, 2015. The law cover not only beasts of burden or livestock but include all the animals. So this uh, law of 2015 is to generalize and modernize this uh, issue in the country. And the third per, uh, perspective is uh, on the wild elephant protection. Most of you might think that uh, we protect wild elephant for the sake of the elephants. It might be true uh, right now, but in the past it wasn't. We protect the elephants just to make sure that we can exploit them uh, sustainably, I mean to make use them sustainably, not to uh, really look into their wealth, wellness or welfare. And this law started uh, back in 1900 and alongside the Wild Elephant Protection Act, we, we started to have um, laws that been modernized to protect our forests, such as uh, Forest Act. This act also not really to protect the forest, but to make sure that we utilize our forest or logging to the full extent to gain the most benefits from them. And then not until 1961 that we got the idea of national park from 
the United, United States. So we had that law back in 1961. And I think at this time, Thai people and the, the authority understand more about uh, forest conservation and reservation as uh, we know today. And after that, we had the 1964 National Reserve Forest to uh, serve further in, in addition to the Forest Act and National Park Act. And in 1960, we had the Wildlife Conservation and Protection Act to look at the uh, fauna and flora conservation. And in 1992, we modernized that law again to be in line with the CITES. And recently, in 2015, we uh, enacted the Elephant Ivory Task Act to uh, focus on the trade of elephant ivory tusks, especially. And lastly, the fourth dimension of the management of and protection of our elephant is on the breeding development and protection. This law is uh, dated back in 1936 and been modernized to cover all the animal breeding uh, since 1966. But in practice, uh, this breeding law cover only um, cattle, cow and buffalo, not yet cover elephant until the minister uh, issue a regulation to cover elephants. So that will be the four dimensions of law on elephant management and protection of Thailand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ajahn Chakrit, for the for the summary from ancient times, uh, the, the, all the laws that, the, the pillars, if you like, that, that started the laws of uh, uh, as they stand today. Um, and now we, I will move on to Sally to ask you to tell us, ask you to tell us about uh, a bit more detail and, and the future and 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 how how the laws operate today and how they all operate together um, and sometimes work together and sometimes seem to be pulling us in different directions. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, John. Let me just share screen and then um, I can walk you guys through it. Right, you're seeing the right screen, right? Yes, we have you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, good evening, everyone watching. And thank you, John, for your invitation and Ajahn Chakrit for the very insightful background which is so important um, for us to understand the historical and cultural context of why elephant laws and policies in Thailand are what they are today. Now, true to a lawyer's fashion, I will start with the caveats. And the contents of today's talk are mostly from a monograph that we have developed in 2018 under USAID Wildlife Asia, which is a counter wildlife trafficking program. Now, at that time, we were working with the Thai National Legislative Assembly on the review of Thai's wildlife law, Thailand's wildlife laws, specifically on the Wild Animal Reservation or Conservation and Protection Act. Um, most people refer to it as the WAPA. We felt there was a need to look at the laws relating to domesticated elephants in Thailand, as well as to have a better understanding and to get a more holistic picture of the legal landscape on CWT in Thailand, um, CWT being counter wildlife trafficking. Without a doubt, this was a team effort. Brian, him, Daria and Val, who was part of the whole team, were instrumental in the development of this monograph. We were also very lucky to have Ms. Belinda Stewart-Cox, a veteran when it comes to elephant conservation and protection in Thailand, as co-author of the paper not to mention correcting all my grammars and spelling mistakes. <laughs> so she's here and she will join us for the discussion during the Q&A session. Now this paper does, does not intend to interpret the laws, but rather review the same from a um, quantitative perspective, 
There is also a possibility that a non-Thai qualified lawyer such as myself may read the law differently. This is where you know, I may have to enlist Ajahn Chakri to help me with that. We would also like to thank Tilikin and Gibbons for the legal review of the in-house English translation of the first draft Elephant Act that we reviewed. So due to the various priorities and the outbreak of COVID, we have to put this paper on the back burner since then. And so we haven't been diligently monitoring the development. So please forgive me if I've missed out any updates since. Nevertheless, what I hope is to be able to share the issues and recommendations on laws relating to elephants. And I will also touch upon the relatively new subsidiary legislation, which may be of interest to you. So let's jump straight into the elephant monograph. The elephant is revered and charismatic, is a revered and charismatic national symbol, symbol of Thailand, as Ajahn Chakrit has mentioned. For centuries, it has been domesticated by the people of Thailand for use as beasts of burden, as a status symbol, and procured as royal properties when they have specific characteristics that identified them as white elephants. The Beast of Burden Act was promulgated in 1939 and primarily to protect ownership and, prevent, and prevention of the theft of livestock by regulating the registration of such animals and elephants in private ownership fall within the purview of this act. When Thailand signed up to the obligation of CITES in 1983, CITES being the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, it has become a delicate balance between its domesticated elephant ownership and its concurrent obligations to CITES, legislating and regulating the conservation, trade in, possession of, and import export of elephants, elephant carcasses, and products. The Draft Elephant Act is another initiative by the Thai government to streamline its laws and thereby fulfilling its obligations and commitment under CITES National Ivory Action Plan. Then, to counter the trafficking of elephants, elephant carcasses and products, to prevent the laundering of wild elephants, specifically Asian elephants, and illegal ivory into the legal domestic ivory trade. So from the outset, there are several challenges that the Draft Elephant Act must address. This includes coordination and jurisdiction of different agencies mandated by different laws. The existence of domestic legal trade in elephant and elephant ivory products versus the illegal trade. Thailand's uh, ongoing international obligation to curb illegal wildlife trade. And inconsistent, overlapping and outdated laws, as you could see uh, from Ajahn Chakrit's presentation. These irregularities create loopholes which could have allowed wildlife traffickers to exploit the illegal trade in elephants and their products. So many of the issues proposed to be addressed by the Draft Elephant Act would have, had, would have an impact on counter wildlife trafficking efforts. And that's the reason why we are looking into it. Further, given the legal domestic trade in ivory and ivory product has an impact on the illegal trade, it is important to adopt a holistic approach when addressing key relevant legislation to have an impact on legislative and policy reform. To that end, we made a baseline comparison of the Draft Elephant Act with the following laws. The Beast of Burden Act, the Elephant Ivory Act, the Wild Animal Reservation and Protection Act, Cruelty Prevention and Welfare of Animal Act, Animal Epidemics Act, and the Wild Elephant Protection Act. As you can see, that was since 1921. It's even older than the Beast of Burden Act. These laws are selected because of their direct references to elephants and also their relevance to issues relating to wildlife trafficking. There are other laws which may be relevant in the enforcement of counter wildlife trafficking, for example, custom acts, which we have not included here. So the key provisions reviewed and compared among the laws mentioned include categories of species covered, i.e. the type of elephants, parts and products, registration of the elephant, their carcasses and products, registration of owners and mahouts, um, registration of businesses in elephant, their carcasses and product, trading, possession, import, export, and transit of elephant, their carcasses and products, the release of elephants into nature, welfare and abuse of elephants, and of course, the penalties associated with such penalties, uh, with such offenses. 
So um, this table sets out the primary purposes, species, and categories of items covered under each law. Uh, I won't go into them, um, but suffice to see that there are a number of overlaps and inconsistent, inconsistency in the coverage by the different laws. And you can also see that the Draft Elephant Act is trying to um, um, uh, remedy this situation in the proposed um, 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 coverage of, of, of its act, or at least the proposed act. So um, here is a table that shows the different implementing agencies under the different law. And again, you can see how the different agencies would need to coordinate among themselves to ensure that there is coherence in the management of domesticated elephants. We have no more, no less than one, two, three, four, about three to four agencies, and they have different departments as well. So what the Draft Elephant Act is trying to do, right, although it falls under the Director General of the Department of Life, um, Livestock Development, um, to, is to create a National Elephant Committee, which comprises of all the different agencies. So that should um, help with the coordination. Um, so this is just a snapshot of some of the uh, uh, penalties that you can see across the different laws. Um, as you can see, there are overlapping offenses. So I picked up trading, import, export, and possession. Um, they all come under different agencies. And by far, the Elephant Ivory Act and the WAPA have the highest penalties. Now that's likely due to the link to the CITES obligation. Okay, so in a nutshell, the Draft Elephant Act proposed to address the following key issues. Um, to consolidate the laws governing domesticated elephants, their carcasses and products. There is a proposal to drastically shorten the time period for registration of birth of a calf from eight years to 30 days. Now this will significantly reduce the chances of laundering elephants, whether from the wild or from another uh, um, um, breeding facilities, um, requiring the owners to register the elephant carcasses and products, and also the businesses and operation, requiring the reporting of transfer, death, and loss of elephants, prohibiting registration of wild caught elephants and wild elephants as defined by the WAPA, regulating the trade and possession of domesticated elephants, their carcasses and products, prohibiting the import and export prohibiting the release of elephants back into nature without provision, requiring, without permission, requiring um, registration of and imposing responsibility on the Mahud, repealing the archaic and outdated elephant protection law, imposing higher penalties and new offenses, and prohibiting abuses and requiring welfare and care of elephants. Now, it is not that some of these provisions are not available. They are, however, as we have demonstrated, they are scattered all over and therefore a consolidated law specifically for the ownership, management and care of domestic animal or domesticated elephants would be ideal. So in the paper, we made some recommendation for the improvement or to the Draft Elephant Act. Um, um, as I've said, you know, I've not really kept in touch with the subsequent uh, revisions of the different uh, drafts. So, some of them might have been addressed already or not, but I will just go through some of these recommendations just so that you can see what are the things that could be improved on it. If they have been, then that's great. So um, number one is to streamline the different laws. The Draft Elephant Act is intended to address multiple issues affecting um, domesticated elephants. Uh, they are covered by the Beast of Burden Act, including the registration, possession, trade, import, export, transit, and welfare of such elephants, their carcasses, and products. There are clearly overlaps and inconsistency between the Draft Elephant Act and the current laws relating to domesticated elephant, namely the Beast of Burden Act, the Elephant Ivory Act, and the Animal Epidemics Act. These overlaps and inconsistency may undermine effective implementation and enforcement. Therefore, it is recommended that if the Draft Elephant Act were to be enacted, elephants must be removed from the Beast of Burden Act and parts of the Animal Epidemics Act, while the Elephant Ivory Act should either be subsumed by or rationalized with the Draft Elephant Act. 
This will ensure that only one law governs and regulates the registration, the possession, trade, import, export, and all other provisions relating to the management of captive Asian elephants, their carcasses and product. It is also important that all subsidiary legislation is streamlined among the various laws, especially where there are cross-references where it can be confusing and create ambiguity. One example is the criteria for import, export, and transport of elephant ivory under the Elephant Ivory Act. So we're talking about domestic, legal domestic ivory trade. This is set out in section five of the act, which refers to rules, procedure, and conditions for application and grant of permission in the ministerial regulation promulgated thereunder, which in turn refers to the compliance with CITES article three and seven. However, the WAPA has its own subsidiary legislation on import, export, and transit of protected species, which includes African and Asian elephants, their carcasses and products. This is, this can, you know, give the elephant uh, ivory act some, um, some illogical uh, uh, rationale as it deals specifically with ivory from elephants regulated under the Beast of Burden Act. And the WAPA deals with elephants not under the Beast of Burden Act. So such contradictory references across different laws are best avoided unless there, is, there are clear equivalents. Um, the Akie um, Elephant Protection Act, which is currently still in force, is also worth reviewing. This law governs the capturing of wild elephants and the state ownership of any elephant that has special characteristics defined in the act. Given that hunting wild elephants is now prohibited under the WAPA and the registration of wild elephant is expressly forbidden in the Draft Elephant Act, those drafting the new laws might wish to revisit the Elephant Protection Act and to consider the, the irrelevance in the light of recent development. Just as a postscript, uh, in the second draft Elephant Act published in the 8th of November on 2018, um, it did propose to repeal the Elephant Protection Act. So um, next we have the penalties. Uh, you have seen how inconsistent, how inconsistent the penalties are across the different laws. And so these should be streamlined. As an example, the penalty tables uh, demonstrated clearly that you know, the incoherent penalty for illegal trade and import export of elephant products across the relevant legislation. Now, there is an interesting bit here, and it could very well be because you know, I, I, don't, I, I am not a Thai speaker and I'm not a Thai qualified lawyer. So the definition of elephant while it's commonly understood what elephant refers to in the Beast of Burden Act and in the Draft Elephant Act, the definition of elephant in each law does not adequately specify this. So if you look at the uh, section four of the Beast of Burden Act, it says it means an elephant, a horse, a buffalo, a mule, a donkey, which has obtained or is required to obtain an identification ticket under this act. And then section four of the Draft Elephant Act, or it could be some other section now, Elephant means elephants which have been registered in accordance with this act, except elephants which is deemed a wild animal under the law on Wildlife Conservation and Protection Act, the WAPA. This is open to interpretation as to whether there is an, whether an imported African elephant can then be registered under the Peace of Burden Act and hence be covered under the Draft Elephant Act. This ambiguity might be nitpicking, but it can be addressed by including a very clear definition to specify that it refers only to Asian elephants or Elephus maximus. Further, in the Animal Epidemics Act, the elephant is one of the animals listed under its purview. Presumably, this covers both elephants as defined in the Peace of Burden Act and in the WAPA. Another issue is the distinction between domesticated elephants under the Beast of Burden Act or, uh, and the Draft Elephant Act and elephants in captivity under WAPA. While elephants are not listed as breedable species under the protected species list, they could be kept and potentially bred under the WAPA provision for establishing zoos. I don't know, uh, there is a potential. And then, um, you know, if you look at registration of elephant, elephant carcasses and products, Although the Draft Elephant Act covers registration of the birth of an elephant calf, presumably by an elephant that is already domesticated under the Beast of Burden Act, and the registration of current owners of the elephants, it does not provide, or it did not provide for the registration of a new elephant. The proposed fine for failure to register the birth of an elephant calf, possession of elephant carcasses and product under the Draft Elephant Act is still rather inadequate from the perspective of laundering wild elephants. 
ivory and ivory products when compared to the elephant ivory act, which if you recall is zero to three million Thai baht. To avoid such loopholes, it is necessary to streamline and synchronize the provisions for elephant and ivory and ivory products under the Elephant Act, uh, Ivory Act with the Draft Elephant Act. And then there's registration by existing owners of elephants, elephant carcasses and products. The Draft Elephant Act provides for existing owners of elephants, their carcasses and products to register the same within 60 days from the date of enactment of the Draft Elephant Act. Presumably, this means that those that are already registered under the Beast of Burden Act and the Elephant Ivory Act. However, it would be prudent to make this clear in the drafting. Moreover, there are no penalties attached to any failure to comply, to comply with this provision, presumably because it has been registered already under the Beast of Burden Act or the Elephant Ivory Act. So the Draft Elephant Act could be clearer in their procedure for the transfer of registration from the Beast of Burden Act and the Elephant Ivory Act to the Draft Elephant uh, Act during the transition. Um, I will skip some of these items that is listed on, on, on the PowerPoint, um, but I will talk about the permit to import, export or transit elephants, uh, their carcasses and product. The Draft Elephant Act allows the import, export and transit of elephants and their carcasses and product under very specific criteria. The Animal Epidemics Act also has rules and regulation for the import, export and transit of elephants. Given the current listings of both Asian and African elephants under CITES and WAPA, there should be no import or export of elephants except as permitted and regulated under WAPA in order to prevent laundering of wild elephants. The role of the Animal Epidemics Act should be limited to the control of diseases and epidemics, and there should be clear coordination with WAPA. Further, elephant has been defined generically and not by species in the Draft Elephant Act. So as I said before, uh, technically African elephant could come under this category if they can be registered under the Peace of Burden Act. Um, a detailed analysis of this issue is really not within the scope of this paper and will require further research and discussion on the possible impact on illegal breeding and laundering of elephant in the captive population. Um, lastly, markings and DNA testing of elephant, elephant carcasses and product. The National Council then uh, for Peace and Order um, made an order in 2016 um, and the Beast of Burden Act have also, have, have also addressed the issue of tagging, microchipping, and DNA testing. However, this applies only to elephants, not elephant carcasses or product, as I understood it. However, I'm not sure whether there are any provisions mandating the marking, tagging, or DNA testing of the ivory and, and ivory product registered under the Elephant Ivory Act. Although the Draft Elephant Act has defined markings, which may include an elephant's genetic code or DNA for elephants and elephant carcasses, there is no provisions mandating the microchipping where applicable or DNA testings of all registered elephants, elephant carcasses and products. Maybe this has changed since our last review, I really don't know. So that is in a nutshell, some of our recommendations for improving the elephant laws. Um, and, and of course, you know, uh, it, it's all in consideration of how it would relate to counter wildlife trafficking. Um, so where are we now with the elephant, the drug elephant law? From what I can see, uh, there have been a few revisions made since the paper was written. There was a, or there were public consultation held between December 2020 to February 2021. So there should be a revised draft uh, out, but I'm not able to locate it at this point. Um, uh, there are some, a group of NGOs and animal welfare group that is proposing a, a new draft bill. Um, so, and, and then we should submit this to, uh, for review. So let's see what happens with this. And this is not out yet, I think, the announcement was made in August, so so we should we should watch the space basically. So that's the Draft Elephant Act. Um, now I have a slide here that says bigger picture, right? I mean, all of us are here because we care about live animals and their welfare. Um, uh, and from a counter wildlife trafficking perspective, I care about the ivory trade. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of details about that, but recently there has been a law 
uh, or, or at least uh, what you call a subsidiary legislation and it's, it's a notification um, that deals with the treatment and welfare of captive elephants. So um, backtracking a little bit, elephant tourism is not an insignificant contributor to Thailand's tourism trade. With the COVID and the pandemic, of course, that has been greatly in, um, uh, affected. Um, but still, uh, it does not uh, uh, put a dent to the significance of elephant in the tourism trade in Thailand. It provided jobs for owners and the elephants um, who were put out of work when logging and street elephants were made illegal. And with the COVID, a lot of them were made unemployed again. How were the elephants kept, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so as long as elephant tourism businesses exist, there is a risk of the laundering of wild elephants uh, and, and other elephant products. Um, the Thai government has done much to reduce this risk by issuing an order in 2017, instructing all the relevant agencies to implement the measures to prevent that, including DNA tests uh, for all elephants in captivities. Um, but more can be done, of course. Um, John would, would be able to share with you how the registration are different depending on how you look at it. Um, so of great concern is the treatment and welfare of captive elephants, especially those in elephant camps and facilities. The Beast of Burden Act is simply inadequate in dealing with the plight of domesticated elephants in that respect, nor was the Animal Welfare Act at the time of its enactment. Recognizing the needs, the urgency, which was partly due to a number of press coverage and pressure from animal welfare group, and I suspect possibly international pressure, the notification of the Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperative prescribing elephant welfare for elephant facilities was issued pursuant to the Cruelty Prevention and Welfare of Animal Act 2014. So this notification came into force. Uh, it was gazetted. Uh, it was gazetted sometime in December last year. So it came into force in June this year. Thank you, John, for the update. So um, I thought it would be interesting to share with um, um, you guys watching some of the highlights of the provisions in this notification. I have not done a detailed review, but I thought it would be interesting to share it. So this notification covers elephant camps and elephant camps has been broadly defined as a place where elephants are kept for use as a vehicle uh, in performance, for use in tourism, in education and conservation, whether there's a direct benefit from the elephant or not. Uh, it covers um, food and water management, management of life space, uh, living space and environment, health and sanitation management, natural behavior management, and mental state management. Now, these last two are quite interesting given the fact that we have always said that elephants are sentient beings uh, uh, and, you know, they deserve a much more humane way, humane way of uh, treatment, including um, being allowed natural behavior and, of course, their mental state when kept in captivity. So for natural behavior management, right, um, there are wordings in there that yet to be seen how it will be implemented is to say, to ensure that all elephants are able to exhibit behavior in foraging, walking, playing, and sleeping. So um, for those camps that, kept, that keeps elephant and, and smaller facilities, um, it will be interesting to see how they can actually encourage that. Um, and also, you know, um, ensuring that they have a plan to deal with the elephants, um, breeding, communicating or interacting with other elephants and limiting aggressive behavior. Again, you know, how that's going to plan out, pan out, uh, uh, I'm actually very eager to see. Um, now, for the mental state, that's the one that uh, is very, very interesting for me. Um, well, it says that you must treat the elephants in accordance with the elephant control method, communicating and approaching the elephants without making them afraid or paranoid, except in cases of uh, where it's necessary to prevent danger to life, property or other animals. Um, so, so that sort of hint to not torturing or using, um, um, what's the word to use, you know, harmful methods in training the elephants. Let's see. Um, to provide a specific area for quarantine for newly imported elephants. 
um, knowledge for elephants. Ah, okay. Weaning may be done with baby elephants that is not less than 30 months old, taking into account the height of the baby elephant. I think that's an improvement. Um, and then the last one, which I really like, is arranging for that mother elephant to rest for at least 12 months. So a 12-month maternity leave is better than most of us human beings, I think. Um, but um, John did bring up an interesting point, and that is in that 12 months that they're resting the mother elephant, what kind of exercise you should be allowed? And there's nothing at this point I can see in the notification that stipulates that. So exercising of elephant is something that we should watch out for, as it's, it's also important both in the physical uh, health as well as mental health. Um, the notification also stipulates the use for, uh, of elephants for work or for performance uh, and, and what should be taken into account. Yeah. So you have the use of elephant for riding as a vehicle. You have the use of elephant for performance, uh, use of elephants to engage in activities with other elephants, and the use of elephants for hauling. So um, in terms of what they prescribe for the different users, right? Um, they, will look at, they will look at the age. They will specify the age of the elephants. For example, if it is for riding, if it's back back riding, uh, then it must be 10 years old to 60 years old or uh, of a minimum height. Um, and then um, loading people, it should not be more than 30, 350 kilograms. They should not work more than eight hours per day. And uh, actual working time should not be four hours per day, which each consecutive working period not exceeding one hour. And the elephant rest time should be at least 15 minutes after each work. So, and it goes on like this, and there are all different stipulations depending on what you're doing with the elephant. Um, uh, the the, 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 you, they also stipulate what kind of activities, less, for example, uh, the use of elephants for performance, right? Um, you can't have them performing um, uh, acts such as standing on two legs or sitting or walking on various driving wheel equipment or using loud noise. Again, they stipulate normal working hours and, and, and rest time, et cetera. Um, and period of training of elephants for performance must not exceed one hour per day. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to see how this will be implemented. And it goes on and on. So I thought this will be really interesting for us uh, animal lovers and, and not just animal lovers, but people who are interested in animal welfare and specifically captive elephants welfare as well. And um, just so that we put everything into perspective, failure to comply with this notification uh, means uh, a breach of section 22 of the Animal Welfare Act or Prevention of Cruelty and Welfare Act. Um, and the maximum fine is 440,000 uh, baht. Okay, so that's where we are. i uh, love to hear what your thoughts are on this. Now, for a copy of the guide, John can actually cut and paste the link on the chat or something like that, so he has it. Um, but I'm sure you can find it on DLD's um, um, website as well. The graphics that you're seeing are actually a, a guidebook that was issued by them in English, um, presumably for the uh, elephant camps that's run by uh, uh, foreigners as well as for people who are interested in what this notification does. Um, so uh, just very briefly, and I'm not gonna go into this. I mean, there has been a lot of discussion about domestic ivory trade and whether it should be banned and whether there should be restriction and I'm not taking any stand on it. Uh, what you're seeing is a snapshot of what countries have done uh, several on several levels, you know, uh, from total ban to having restrictions, etc. So um, it's it's interesting if Thailand is looking into how they can restrict domestic ivory trade. These are the issues that will link that you have to look into, uh, and and I think I will stop here. I hope this gives you an idea of the legal consideration relating to, to captive Asian elephant or domesticated elephants in Thailand. And it's probably gonna give rise to more questions than answer, but that's a good thing. So thank you. 
Thank you very much, Sally. Okay, uh, and to put, I, I've had to move inside, by the way, so I'm not standing in the middle of a river. I just have a fake background. <laughs> um, and I guess to put into some perspective this this notification on the animal cruelty law. Um, now, Sally's going to correct me if I've got this right, but um, but that came into force in June 2021. As a manager of elephants in an elephant camp, um, for whom that English document must have been written, there are, there are very few of us, I presume there's a Thai one out there as well, um, we only discovered that there was this new law out um, telling us how we could look after our elephants um, with specifications such as vague specifications still, I would say, um, when they came to visit us to, to talk to us about it uh, literally last week. So uh, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I have heard previously um, that the Department of Livestock Development were treating the, the shortened time for registration of a baby elephant uh, and this is several years ago, as, as the law. So they were acting within, within the draft and Elephant, Elephant Act, even though it hadn't been passed. They were insisting, um, this is so long ago, we actually had a baby born here, and I can't remember when we last had the baby born, but they were saying you must register within 30 days. So, um, Well, that's uh, great, but then there's no penalty if you don't. No, exactly. We, we didn't we didn't push it, but there is there is there would have there could have been no legal penalty if, if we didn't. So um, and I guess the other question is when you say the maximum fine is 40,000 baht, which doesn't sound an awful lot. Although, as I said, when we were discussing this earlier, I'm, I swear I've seen uh, seen provisions in Thai law where the, 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 the maximum fine for a murder is 5,000 baht. So uh, under certain circumstances, and maybe that's an old law as well, I don't know. Um, but I wonder if it's 40,000 baht per case, in which case you could come up with, could, could come up with a fairly hefty fine. Um, and to be honest, 40,000 baht is, a, is, is quite a bit of money in today's, uh, in today's non, non-functioning business environment. But I guess if you're making millions every day from, from a thousand guests, uh, 40,000 is, is an occupational hazard. Yeah, um, I mean, the thing is, the thing is, I've, I, I don't quite understand it. And, and that maybe that I'm biased because I'm a, a you know, I, I do care about these animals. But, you know, uh, even if you're treating your, your, your team of elephants as purely a workforce, a labor force, right? Um, it makes sense. It makes good investment sense to take good care of them. I mean, they live so long and they can serve you for so long. So the healthier they are, the more they can serve you. It's as simple as that. They, 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 don't, they don't jump ship and move to another elephant camp, you know, just because conditions are not so good here, not like human beings, you know. Um, maybe that's the problem. They need managers, proper managers, independent agents. Anyway, yeah. So okay. it will be interesting as to how they will implement the uh, notification. So do keep us informed, John, because you'll probably be one of the implementers. Yes, I, 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 having read through them, I think I think we're unlikely to be hauled off for jail or fined. I think we we we, we hopefully we exceed in, in most cases. Uh, Belinda, I see you making notes up there. Um, would you like to Would you like to comment? <laughs> well, I, I I've been absolutely intrigued by both presentations. Thank you, Dr. Chakra and Sally. I mean, really, really um, superb presentations for for this um, this uh, uh, seminar. I just wanted to add, in a way, a, a sort of sideline, which is my own fascination with this, is how history, how attitudes shape law, and then law drags behind attitudes because law takes so long to get changed. And so Dr. Chakrit's presentation has highlighted, you know, it through the history of the different laws that the attitudes in those days were that, were, were that, were that elephants were there to be exploited, partly because they could be exploited, which is something that I've always found absolutely extraordinary that a five-year-old child can control an enormous elephant, but they can be exploited, therefore they were, and they were useful. And so the laws reflected that, as Dr. Chakra pointed out, to prevent theft, to prevent, you know, various things. And then gradually, uh, 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 gradually, I mean, because the laws were the way they are, the bureaucracy was shaped accordingly. And because the bureaucracy was shaped accordingly, the training was shaped accordingly. And that then reinforced attitudes so that, you know, in the Department of Livestock necessarily, 
you're going to have different attitudes from people in a different department. And then what, of course, is so interesting, then you get, the, in this case, which you don't get with <coughs> buffaloes or whatever, other, other beasts of burden, you've then got the override of religion, and that then translates into monarchy. So you've got a whole additional component which, which is, is also historical, of course, because the religious has come from, from Hinduism. But what I think is so interesting, and then when I first came to Thailand in 1986, conservation was still very, very small. I mean, there were the laws, the 1960s, Dr. Chakrit pointed out, the 1960 National Park Act and the 1961 Act for the um, for WARPA. But but the department of the department that they weren't departments, they weren't even divisions, they were units. The wildlife division was a unit in, in the then forest department, and the national park team were a unit. And gradually, as conservation has come up, you know, so we are seeing not only a change in need. So the early laws, as Dr. Chakra highlighted, were a need, a need to, 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 tim, to cut trees, a need to, to transport, et cetera. Now there's a new need. There's an environmental protection need and a wildlife protection need and biodiversity gradually, gradually recognized over the last 30 years. But attitudes are stuck. You know, attitudes have to be forced to change and even more slowly the laws reflecting that. So it is very interesting to see how, you know, over those years, so now you have not just a new ministry, so gradually conservation unit became a division, became a department, and then the two, the forest department and the, and the conservation, they split. So gradually the, the bureaucracy caught up, but within that you've got politics, you've still got entrenched attitudes that to some extent come from experience, your experience, which in itself comes from your training. And it's so interesting to see how all this, in a way, becomes compounded and, of course, also embedded in there, and dare I say it, but I, I will because I'm, I say what I'm thinking, compounded is self-interest, as Dr. Chakrit pointed out, there were people who then could make, a, were making a great deal of money out of elephants, people in high places with political friends, and, of course, the added component in all politics and all bureaucracy, but the world over of corruption. So all this is compounded. But then, this is so interesting, we get the, the forced, if you like, forced change in attitudes coming, I would say, largely internationally, which is the, the pressure for, for on trade, as Sally pointed out, the, the, the international trade, increasing pressure there, and increasing pressure on welfare, the concern about welfare, which is a huge international thing. And, and what makes, what makes you know, it so interesting in Thailand, and why Thailand, and I, you know, I, I, you know, good for Thailand, I say, in many ways, is, is lead, in some ways leading on establishing these new standards is because Thailand is, in a way, uniquely vulnerable. It has this enormous tourism industry, a huge proportion of which did have an elephant component. And it can be, it's very vulnerable to being hit very hard by the international tour operators. And in some ways you can, you know, you can lament that. And I dare say there are people in the tourism industry in Thailand who do lament that and are, and, and are mighty cross with the likes of you know Peter or whoever but I think of I think of organizations like that as the sort of terriers you know these biting biting at the goalposts that change the goalposts and actually it's good to change those goalposts to, so that attitudes the attitudes that were entrenched back in the 1920s or in the 1800s or wherever are forced to change because it takes quite a lot to change even one's own individual attitude. Actually, you have to be made aware, you have to think about it, you have to reflect. And quite often you're being forced to change attitudes that you don't really want to change. How much harder it is to do at national level such that it's then reflected in law and politicians and generally bureaucracies don't generally want to change them because it's a heck of a business to change laws as Sally knows and as Dr. Chakra knows it's a heck of a business and so there's always this foot dragging so so I it's in, in a way you know the, the the Dr. Chakra presented the very interesting historical background to these laws and Sally's pre presented the more legal point of view from the from the you know the legal technical point of view and, and I'm just adding in this tuppence worth of how interesting it is to see the human element being forced to engage in this. And that is really, that is, is in a way, 
is in a way attitudes and, and training and systems and you know how they become established and how how interesting it is that what it is that forces the change that it, we now see happening in Thailand, partly the tightening of biodiversity protection, if I could put it broadly, which, which is also where trade comes in, but also this tremendous pressure to, to treat elephants more, if you, I, could, I would like to say humanely, because they are recognized and have long been recognized in religion and also, and also in the spiritual component of all this, they have long been recognized as highly sentient beings, which is nobody is nobody is um, giving the domestic buffalo or a cow the same kind of status as the elephant, and it's because the elephant is recognised as a highly sentient being. I think so. There is, as Sally pointed out, and Dr. Tart, this is a curiously conflicting attitude, which has been in place now for hundreds of years. Of on the one side reverence, and on the other side beasts of burden but at the end of the day if you will forgive me for using this um horrible you know this sort of cliche at the end of the day what we have are wild animals in chains and gradually gradually i think the law the laws of thailand and full marks to thailand actually but the laws of thailand are beginning to really recognize that and to enshrine that in law and that in time will now one hopes also change attitudes so that so that the as, at people's attitudes in the country support the law because the attitudes change to recognize that this is not just it not just legal now and so you want to but actually it's right it's right it's morally right as well as being practically right the practical coming in because of say tourist pressure CITES pressure whatever but it's morally right and so Thailand's bureaucracy is trying whether they're doing it for that reason I don't know but I think there are a lot of people who are but but is is catching up so it's such a his, it's such an interesting um broader than just the historical the historical acts themselves and the 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 legal the legal discrepancies that Sally pointed out it's a bigger thing it's it's a mirror to to us as people it's a mirror to humanity and it's a mirror to Thai society and the changes that have been going on there and that have been wrenchingly going on because it is wrenched often and COVID has really wrenched it because COVID has put an absolute spanner in the works of elephant tourism. Well, all tourism, but we're focusing on elephant tourism. So it is a, it's a really interesting story, if I can put it like that. So, you know, you, it's a story and it's a really dramatically interesting story. And, and you know, I do say, I do say it, it sounds right, but I do say full marks to Thailand. I look forward, given my history, with, I look forward to Thailand leading the way on this because it's right. And other countries will, I hope, follow for the same reason, because it's right and because they also come under tremendous pressure to do so. Thank you, Belinda. Um, a summation and an addition that was brilliant um, and of course you have the added dimension that maybe um, which doesn't help um, Sally and, and Ajahn Chakrit's cause of trying to demystify the laws for us that, that the, the one piece of legislation that we think we have although we don't know how it's going to be implemented um, is has been, um, if you like, or it appears to me to the, to have been added to the the by the Department of Livestock Development to the animal welfare or the animal cruelty law, um, kind of working around the I don't know about fact, but certainly the impression that the the draft Elephant Act had um, had hit some quicksand and wasn't going anywhere. Um, and so, and I wonder if part of the confusion going back, and Sally can tell us about this, or I don't agree, about the confusion and the number of, of different laws, or whether that has happened in the past, that when the, 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 one, the one law sort of needed a lot of approval and got, got stuck in the, the rewriting and the, as, as you said, they, be, they had a public hearing, had public hearings about the Draft Elephant Act, and allegedly I wasn't, I wasn't in the Bangkok meetings, I think I, we, we went, to, uh, I'm looking across at Nisa there, who's there, she went, she was there online, um, and allegedly that got bogged down by, by some of the more entrenched views of people who are, have been, for whom the situation has been working quite nicely, and why should we need to change, 
And so yeah. it's interest, very interesting to me that the Department of Livestock Development appears to have said, well, okay, that, that being the case, what can we do to, to keep this moving forward, to, to keep the momentum? And then to add the, the, as I say, fairly vague, very basic, very, very doable, should be doable because they're right, but no, nothing, there's nothing mind blowing in there as far as we can see. Um, welfare provisions uh, specifically onto the Animal Cruelty Act. So I, w I wonder if that's a common way for laws to be written or whether that's just a, an elephant thing or a tie thing. What do you reckon, Sally? Or Ajahn Chakrit? Yeah, and maybe I'll just say, and I'll, I'll defer to Ajahn Chakrit because he's the only expert when it comes to Thai law, you know. Um, but I, I think also um, just tagging on what Belinda has said about the bureaucracy, I mean, this happens everywhere. Um, normally, it takes a long time to, part, to, to, to get a draft uh, law passed. You know, you have to go through so many um, gates. And, and there's a good reason for that, you know. But then it's always easier to change the subsidiary legislation whether, and, and of course in Thailand, you have the different types, you have the, 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 the rules, the, the regulations, you have the notifications, et cetera, et cetera. It's usually, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ajahn Chakrit, right? easier to get those through. Um, I mean, you yourself mentioned that you have not even heard about it and it was done um, um, to, to pass that through. And, and I like to think that, you know, instead of um, uh, working against the, the bureaucracy, the drag of the bureaucracy, they decided, you know, I'm just going to do this because this is an easier way and elephants gets protected, you know. And, and I suspect that's the reason why in some parts of the world, no matter how hard you try, somehow the laws are always piecemeal and it's sort of stopgap, you know, plugging the mm -hmm. holes and you get frustrated with it at the beginning, but I'm actually learning to understand why, because it's easier to get things done because ultimately if what we want to do is to ensure that the elephants are treated properly and have some sort of welfare care and some rules on it, right? It's at the same time, while you're pushing for the law, let's do what we can in order to ensure that they are covered somehow in the meantime. So, uh, Ajahn Chakri. Thanks, Sally. Actually, you have said it all. <laughs> in, <laughs> in brief, I will say that it's all about politics and bureaucracy. So it means there are so many buttons around. I suggest that you have to find all those buttons and push them all. and it didn't work. I think this is uh, quite universal everywhere. Uh, it depends sure. uh, maybe yeah. in some yeah. countries there are more buttons than the others or something like that. I think that's the point and Sally has said it all. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I don't check it. Thank you everybody. Um, I can look, there's no, there are no um, questions on Facebook, so we, we must have covered it all. I have put the link to the leaflet for those who people who've asked for it um, on, on the Facebook chat. So if anybody would like to go to the, uh, it, it takes you to the Department of Livestock Development's Google Drive. And um, it's, as, as, as Sally pointed out, it's an English illustrated leaflet for, for those of us, those of us presumably managing elephants who, who can't be expected to read Thai, or I would like to think I could read a bit of Thai, but I couldn't read a, a legal leaflet. Presumably there is, a, there is some Thai ver verbiage somewhere underpinning all of this that, that actually prescribes what it is exactly we, we can and cannot do. Um, and I think the next, the next thing to do, and I, I have been working with the Department of Livestock Development, they came to visit us, as I said last week, is to find out exactly what's written and, and to, to make sure that first of all, we comply and exceed, and then, then to let people, know more about it when, when we know about it itself. It's just interesting that it is apparently currently in force and we don't know about it. <laughs> Can I ask a question, John? When, when you're doing that investigation, what would be um, interesting to know and is whether in that you knew whatever it is, regulation or law or whatever it is, whether the Department of Livestock has recognized that of all its charges, in other words, it, you know, it looks after cattle and buffaloes and you know, all the livestock animals, whether it's recognizing in that regulation that of all, its, of all those animals that it, it, has, it deals with under the law and under the bureaucracy, that this one animal is different because it's the only one that has not been genetically modified from the wild 
uh, conspecific. So, you know, the, the buffalo is genetically chromosomally different, the cattle are all chromosomally different, the sheep are all chromosomally different, etc. But the wild, the elephant is still the wild animal it always was. And whether that's actually recognized in this law, it would be interesting. And, and if they've done that, then full marks to the livestock department. I, 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 I you know, I applaud them for making that statement you know that old statement because it because everything they're doing comes stem well not everything because actually we want all animals to be looked after well but you know it's it would be an interesting point i will find out and let you know or i'll ask sally to find out and let you know because <laughs> no um we're, we're in contact so the, the team will continue yeah. to dig in and get the, get the tie documents and uh, and pass them pass them to to all of you all present yeah lovely Lovely. All right. Very interesting. Well, I learned. A, I well, I I learned a lot, but I was also reminded of a lot. So it was extremely valuable and and most engaging. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that that is it. Um, I as I say, things are getting a bit hectic around here. This is the last one of the year, but we will be back in January with more elephant professionals. I've got quite a few people lined up. Uh, only one or two dates confirmed, but we're going to concentrate on looking after our elephants i guess it's the best way to put it and and our guests over the over the hectic period so thank you very much to everybody who's been watching throughout 2021 thank you of course to all of our elephant professional lecturers in that year in, in this year um uh, please everybody enjoy the the next the next few weeks and enjoy the season however however you tend to celebrate it um and thanks most of all of course to Adan Chakrit and to Sally for for giving and Belinda of course as well for giving us very fine Christmas. no I didn't do anything the, I just listened uh, you, you listened and you you concentrated us you focused us as as you always do um <laughs> in, enjoy everybody um we will see you uh we will see you on the other side um in January for more elephant professional lectures thank you very much to everybody who's been a part of it Lovely. and we will we will speak to you everyone over, everyone. Um, over the over the, the coming few weeks. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye bye. bye.